Okay, so I'm going to get started. And firstly, by saying the usual that we're all now saying in Zoom as we're joining live across the world. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you're joining us. Um, I have the great pleasure of welcoming and hosting a book launch uh, for Countering Violent Extremism, Making Gender Matter. Um, we've got the three co-authors joining us together. Uh, we have Dr. Elizabeth Pearson, who's a lecturer at Royal Holloway University. We have Emily Winterbotham, a director at RUSI, and Dr. Catherine Brown, a senior lecturer at the University of Birmingham. Um, thank you, three of you, for, for joining. It's a real pleasure to have you here. Um, what we're going to do for format is that Liz is going to kick us off with a short presentation, give us an introduction to the book, um, some of your main findings, how you went about doing this research, giving us some background, then I'm probably going to abuse my position as chair and ask you guys a couple of questions. And then really we're going to open this up to the floor. So our main aim is to have a highly interactive and engaging conversation with Q&A open to all of our virtual audience. If you have a question, please put it in the Q&A function and um, we can answer it live. If there's anything that isn't answered within the one hour slot, which hopefully we'll have plenty of time, but if, in case there isn't, um, we should be able to give some written responses. But I'm going to hand it straight over to Liz to kick us off. Thanks. Thanks so much, Gina, and thanks to ICSR for hosting us. I'm just going to share a presentation. So uh, do you give me a shout if you uh, can't see this. I'm assuming everyone can see the presentation and can also um, see me. So um, thank you so much to everybody also for coming along to this event where we're talking about the book Countering Violent Extremism, Making Gender Matter. I'm just going to briefly introduce you to the book before we have a wider discussion and using the next 10 minutes to talk about you know, what we did, what we found, um, what we argue in this book and what we recommend and just the headline points for those things. And this book is based on research that set about to answer two research questions. The first was, what are the gender dynamics of uh, violent extremism? And the second was, what are the gender dynamics of countering violent extremism? And both this presentation and the book you know, it's not just for gender people, gender experts, or for women interested in radicalization, but for everybody, because one of the key takeaways is that radicalization is gendered, and how men radicalize uh, also necessitates talking about gender. So what do we do? Well, the book is based on research that we did in five countries in um, 2015 to 16. It was an important period. It was pre the Brexit referendum, pre the election of President Trump. It was a period that contained the Paris attacks by Islamic State. And it was a period in which the so-called migration crisis was uh, really in the headlines in, in Germany. And we set out to investigate two ideologies in these countries, uh, Western countries, the far right and jihadism. And the far right was a sort of secondary concern at that time in all of these countries, um, not as much as it is now. And we used a methodology which we call the milieu approach, which was um, intended to mitigate some of the problems of doing this kind of difficult, uh, sensitive research, and it involved a process of listening and empathetic um, cooperation. And we were essentially talking to people who were at grassroots level in communities using focus groups and um, some interviews as well. So what did we find in our headlines? Well, thinking about violent extremism, what we discovered through talking to people who had experience of radicalization in their communities, in their families, in their local um, places, was that radicalization is gendered. Now, we, uh, this finding is basically uh, based on conversations with Muslim communities. We, although we tried to explore these two ideologies, we had much more success, we'll talk about in the discussion, um, finding out about jihadism rather than the far right. And what we found talking to communities was that everything that the theory says is a factor in radicalization is gendered and they gave us examples of how. The spaces where people were being radicalized um, were gendered. 
men and women were radicalizing in different ways because of cultural norms, societal expectations, which differed for men and for women because of their gendered identities and how they understood those in their context and relating to the rhetoric of extreme groups because of their friendship networks and their family networks. And we could see too that the kinds of narratives that were being used um, were also gendered. And what was clear here was that communities that we spoke to, often deeply affected and depressed by what had happened to them, had real expertise and knowledge relating to the ways in which young people were being approached by Islamic State, whether that was on the streets or in, on the internet or wherever that was happening. We also were interested in the gender dynamics of countering violent extremism. And what we saw here was somewhat surprising given the different histories of prevention strategies in the five countries that we were looking at, was that Muslim community focus groups, and, and they were the key focus groups who um, understood what countering violent extremism meant, they'd been the key recipients of this intervention, they kind of told us the same things across these countries. Um, they were resistant to many of the ways in which interventions were delivered and some of the ways in which they, they happened, particularly around gender and particularly around the kinds of roles and responsibilities that they felt that Muslim women um, were given in countering radicalization and violent extremism. And what we could see was that gender and countering violent extremism programs was still predominantly about women. It wasn't about gender dynamics, gender as a social construct, it wasn't about power. What we could also see that when we went into uh, communities that had been affected by far right, radicalization that had had far-right rallies or violence was that those people living there when we tried to talk to them about far-right extremism very much felt that this wasn't a problem for them this was something that belonged somewhere else it was someone else's problem even when this was you know on their doorstep and what we could also see was that there were very different logics employed by governments and intervention providers in how uh, far-right interventions and jihadist counter-radicalization interventions were um, delivered. So with jihadist counter-radicalization, it's very much about demographics, about Muslim communities, about mosques, about imams. In the far right, um, tackling that, that was much more kind of targeted, focused on you know, where um, that need was felt. So it was clear to us that there were very different things going on in terms of the interventions and the logic scale and scope of, of how those were happening. So those findings, briefly lead us to four arguments in the book. And the first is a sort of obvious one, that gender matters, but that gender is not about just women. We need to think and we talk to men um, too, and we need to think about them in positive roles as well as, you know, as suspect, as, as risky. Masculinities also matter in this space, and we need to really get away from seeing gender as a synonym for women, and this is happening. We also um, argue that active listening is really, really important because we need to recognize that communities have expertise and they have knowledge, but we also need to recognize what they say and feel about violent extremism and countering it and respond to this. Because when they say that they resist certain practices, these need to change. It's not enough to constantly listen to and document the same complaints and critiques over and over without seeing any changes in this regard. And this also matters in trying to tackle the far right, which is more of a priority now. So our third argument is around the importance of recognizing the difference in these ideologies and how that must shape responses. So when we went to talk to people about the far right, what we could see is there was very little acknowledgement of this as extremism or of the structural components in the far right or the ideological components or really the role of um, communities, broadly speaking, in combating this. So these two movements are not the same um, and they require different responses. You can't just replicate CVE responses designed to counter jihadism and, and apply them to the far right. And finally, uh, and again, this is widely acknowledged uh, that evidence matters and that we ha must have a needs-based approach and also you know, what people want as well as what they need. And that's the final argument we make in the book. So what we recommend in this book is um, that gender must mean going beyond women. We need to think about men, we need to include men and um, in proactive and positive ways as fathers, as role models. And we heard this from men and women in all of the focus groups that we spoke to.
We also need to ensure that our monitoring and evaluation gathers and acts on gendered evidence. And this is particularly important given that gendered security um, programs have, we know, created harms. They've securitized particular populations. They have um, used and exploited the women's rights agenda. And this has been problematic in, in many ways. So we need to make sure that our gendered interventions are based on evidence that will work. We need to listen to and respond to and act on community critiques. Um, there are so many critiques by now. And you know, particularly for Muslim communities have been feeding back for many years and have a great deal of fatigue around this topic generally. But we also need to listen, respond to and act on community critiques that come from those communities where far right radicalization has been a problem. And, and that can be difficult because that may, means taking seriously feelings of disempowerment whilst never legitimizing um, racism. Um, that's also important. We have to recognize the far right is a structural and a societal problem that many of the narratives of far right um, propaganda and rhetoric are replicated. They overlap with narratives in mainstream discourse. And this is something which differs from jihadist um, narratives and radicalization. And finally, we all really believe in gender and CVE. You know, we, we feel that we stand, and we say this in the book, at a really pivotal moment in thinking about countering violent extremism. We know what the critiques are in terms of gendered CVE. We acknowledge them and we need to work on them, but this isn't a reason for abandoning gendered CVE or not doing it. What we want and what we hope that our book does is to make the argument for how this can be done better and why it really, really matters. And that's something which we're happy to take questions on and discuss in the conversation following. And um, thank you all very much for listening uh, on behalf of me and my co-authors. Thanks very much, Liz. Um, so just to remind everyone, please put questions in the Q&A box and uh, we will answer them live. I'm going to kick off if that's all right and just really abuse my power that I've been given. Um, so I'm going to kick off with Emily, if that's OK. Um, I want to know what were the main concerns and perceptions of violent, extrem violent extremism among the communities that you researched? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think... I mean, Liz mentioned this too. I think one of the important things that the research showed was that even though we were looking at different country contexts and different communities, um, many of the findings were stark in the fact that they were shared um, and the same concerns and perceptions were coming up in um, you know, France as they were in Canada, for example. Um, and so on the kind of surface, when you ask people the first question, you know, what is violent extremism to you? People would talk about violence, terrorism, suicide attacks, and inevitably ISIS. Um, I mean, as Liz said, we did the research in 2015 and 16, and so that was in the forefront of people's minds. But digging a little bit you know, deeper and going underneath the surface, this didn't mean that participants accepted those definitions. Instead, that they felt that those definitions and the narratives around extremism and initiatives um, to counter extremism um, had led to the targeting of particularly Muslim populations. Um, not only by, I think, you know, raising awareness by organizations like Daesh, but actually by Islamophobes. Um, so there was a strong resentment across all focus groups in all countries, um, Muslim focus groups, um, to the actual concept of, of CVE and kind of discussing violent extremism as a concept um, as well. And instead, interestingly, participants had their own definition um, of what violence and violent extremism was, was to them. So, you know, I think back to when we were in Canada um, and we were there at the time of the November 2015 Paris attacks. So young Canadian Muslim women were saying to us, you know, violent extremism for us, that's Islamophobia, that's violence directed at us, that's abuse and um, hatred that they were facing, particularly at that moment, but also just generally um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I do think it's important, you know, to kind of note that Canada stood out a little bit in the research, um, given that at the time they didn't really think that they had a problem with violent extremism. So for them, they were looking at 
particularly you know, news reports of everything that was happening in Europe at the time. And they were saying, um, you know, they were associating violent extremism uh, with Europe rather than, than with Canada. And so they were talking about things like failed integration um, as responsible for radicalization and comparing the kind of Canadian experience as kind of equal democratic society um, with what they were seeing as potentially examples of failed integration um, in Europe. And yet, even though they didn't feel that they had the same level of problems of violent extremism, we had very similar narratives when you looked at the UK. So participants would talk about, um, you know, it's to do with people who don't speak English. It's the fact that they can't speak to their kids. They don't understand what's going on. Um, and that's what's driving radicalization. You know, and we know that research doesn't support this. But the interesting thing is that that's what communities were internalizing um, and actually, you know, repeating back to us. In part, um, we concluded that was because of government narratives, um, that they would listen to what governments, how governments framed the problem. Um, and then, you know, articulate, articulate that, but also what the media was saying, you know, participants understandings are framed by their own lived experiences, by what they hear on the news, by what they hear governments are saying, um, by experts and, you know, people sitting, listening uh, to this presentation. Um, and so what they say is actually important because it reflects not only what they care and, and believe, and as Liz, Liz said, you know, what they reject and, and want changing. Um, but I think it also reflects some of the discussions um, and, you know, false truisms potentially that are, that are circulating at the time. So one of the things that was quite stark was that there was no um, acknowledgement that far right the far right was, you know, linked to extremism, as, as Liz had said, they didn't, re you know, think that this was extremism because they just saw extremism as ISIS. Um, and that was kind of obscuring all forms of, of other um, extremism. But at the same time, communities, you know, in, in areas where there had been far right activity, um, I'm thinking in the UK, we, you know, we did conduct research where there had been instances of um, far-right violence, they didn't still see it as anything to do with them. It was something to do with other people. Um, it wasn't their problem. It wasn't up to them to solve. And that is a real barrier to, to tackling the far right. Um, and as I think Liz said in, in the kind of recommendations and some of our arguments, you know, we need to see far more attention paid to um, the far right, which I think we have in recent years, um, but also looking at it as a structural and societal problem. And I'll just add one point about gender because, um, you know, I don't want to say that the participants didn't didn't reflect on it because they clearly did. You know, as Liz said, there were differences um, in the way that they perceived men and women um, as vulnerable to radicalization. Um, but at the same time, participants are complex and, you know, they also lapped into stereotypes. So we would have... Um, of uh, them talking about jihadi brides or women as victims, you know, um, men being blamed. Um, and at this, you know, then, then the sim simultaneously they were talking about women who had agency. So I think, you know, it is very important, particularly I think if, if anyone reads the book, um, to be aware that, um, you know, the research itself, when you look at participants and, and their, their experiences and, and their perceptions, um, some of it, um, you know, needs to be needs to be analysed against those kind of complex lived experiences um, and the stereotypes that we we see kind of bounding around um, in media, etc. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. No, absolutely. And actually, when you talk about how the far right wasn't necessarily on people's radar within the definition or concept of violent extremism, it'd be fascinating if you guys extended this and did almost a longitudinal study and see whether now that has changed, not only in the uptake within scholarship, but also, as you so rightly said, within media and, and policy that really does direct people's um, ideas and concepts uh, on extremism. Um, I'm going to turn to Catherine next, if that's all right. Um, so in the book, you obviously talk about gendered radicalization. So it'd be really helpful to know what is gendered radicalization? What do you guys mean by it? Um, how is it distinct from other models of radicalization that already exist in the literature? And, and why should this be a focus now? 
even though we've known for some time and um, we keep plugging the same drum within gender and terrorism studies that women have engaged in extremism for a long time and in different ways for many years, why should this be a focus now? Thank you so much, Gina, for that question. Um, well, I think the, the first point about why now in part is because, as you've said, this has been an ongoing struggle to get gender recognized and acknowledged. And for us, gathering the evidence to demonstrate how gender matters was hugely important. Because yes, uh, when we look at the global agenda, such as the Women, Peace and Security agenda, the links that have been made at the United Nations and in other um, international organizations that women's empowerment, women's equality, women's rights matter for countering violent extremism. That has come at some cost in terms of this instrumentalization of women's rights and perhaps the securitization and the sidelining actually of those agendas to this overall security goal. But also we found some backlash by saying, oh, but we've included all these women, but nothing's really changed. Um, so we wanted to also look at, well, really how has that happened? Uh, what's been going on? What do the communities understand? So that's partly the why now. And the second part comes as well with recognizing that in the past, much of our mainstream theories of radicalization, especially when they focus on the individual, really start with an assumption that that individual is male. Or in fact, they don't even open with that. Like it's like this unsaid things, here's my data set, here are the people I've interviewed. And no one actually says, but, but they're all men. And how has their male experience, how has their male pathways, what are the processes that tap into certain forms of masculinity? What's that done to your data? And no one's asked that question. Well, over time, scholars like yourself, Emily, myself, others have been doing this, but we really wanted to uh, look at that and develop and understand processes of radicalization that begin with an awareness of gender, not just tacking it on at the end with a, oh, I forgot about gender, let's do a bit, right? So we were starting from that. And so what we mean by gendered radicalization is a recognition that gender involves the roles. So it's about looking at the roles of men and women, which makes it relational. So we're not, when we say men matter, and we should be looking at men. Well, some people would turn around and say, well, that's part of the problem is that all we do is look at men, right? But we don't look at men as men. So it's not about looking at their gender. They're just assumed to exist in this gender neutral bubble, which of course isn't true. So we're looking at the relational roles between men and women. We're looking at how gender then shapes the resources that are available to people and the pathways, but also the narratives. So men and women are radicalized and engage in violent extremism through both public and private reasons. So it's both the personal and political. But how something is personal shifts based on gender narratives how something is political also reflects their gendered experiences. So yes, it's both personal and political. We can't just say, oh, women get involved for radicalization and violent extremism because of love, as if men don't, or because of trauma, or men do it for rational political reasons, but women don't. Women do it for political reasons too, but how they express that politics is different. The narratives they use for that politics is different and the same for men, and that reflects certain ideologies. And that came through in the research that we did in looking at how communities understood violent extremism. And in part, Emily, uh, not in part, Emily is entirely right, um, about this, this question about, well, what kind of things do people talk about? Why were they reflecting back stereotypes? And how can I then, we then insist on a nuanced understanding of gendered radicalization when some of our participants were giving us back the stereotypes? Because when you read through what else they're saying and not just see the headline, when you analyze more deeply and do some real intensive critical data analysis and not just the, the keyword search term function that you might otherwise do, then you see what else is going on. Um, and that's why gendered radicalization is so important to fully understanding the processes, the narratives and the experiences uh, across the board. And I'll stop there. Absolutely, and that's also why not only this book, but the whole concept of gender ra radicalization is so important beyond purely scholarship. Because as you said, seeing past those headlines is absolutely critical to breaking down a lot of these stereotyped assumptions around, dare I say it, jihadi brides and, and all of the other terms that we keep seeing floated around 
I mean, the the term jihati, I think all of us, we just want to, you know, anyway. Um, so last question from me, this one's going to come to Liz, and then I've already seen some questions in the Q&A box, so that's great. Um, so through through this book and through through the uh, the research that you did, you explored the gender dynamics of, of not only violent extremism, but counter violent extremism from both very different types of ideologies from jihadist and also extreme far right. So can you give us an idea on what are the similarities and differences? And did these vary within and across the countries that you looked at as well? Yeah, so I mean, it was one of the frustrations of this research, I think, that we didn't get as far in doing, we set out to look at these kind of equally, these two ideologies, and we just couldn't do that. Because we were going, we were to some degree replicating the kind of logics of how CV is delivered in order to understand you know, how communities are engaging with it. So um, we kind of followed the logics and we went, in, we went to gatekeepers in Muslim communities to talk to them about you know, their experiences with countering violent extremism. So we did talk to a lot of people in Muslim communities who had had some, you know, they've gone to workshops, they've, they've watched videos. And when we went into um, communities that had experienced far right violence rather than countering violent extremism strategies, we did not find an, an awareness of countering violent extremism as a thing that impacted the far right, except in Germany, which was the exception because there has been a much longer history of uh, countering far right interventions there. And we, um, so we struggled. We struggled to get those stories of people's far right radicalization. We, we spoke to one person in Canada who was part of an extreme far right group. Um, but that wasn't very much. We didn't have those accounts of people joining far right groups and we didn't have that, that same kind of knowledge of countering violent extremism on the far right. But what we did see was people's attitudes towards um, far right uh, extremism and violence expressed in the focus group. So, um, and they differed across the countries to some degree. So um, in Germany, we had a lot of people talking about initiatives that they didn't feel had worked or stigma associated with communities based on the far right or what they thought was responsible for the far right and so, you know, focus groups that I had done um, where people would talk for, you know, half an hour about it was the fault of the former East Germany. And then I, I would say, what about what about the far right demo and the violence in your town last month? And they would say, oh, yeah, uh, that's and to say, well, that can't be the fault of the of people in East Germany. And so there was a lot of separation. People really didn't kind of see this as their problem, even when it was on their doorsteps. And there was a lot of distancing. From, from this and people also didn't see this as extremism why not just because the media and people wanted to talk about the media a lot we didn't want to talk about it but to get them back on track quite often but we let focus groups talk about what they felt to be the priorities it was part of the approach um, but so it wasn't just because of the media it was also because they felt that the far right was about it was about stupidity it was about angry white men who drunk too much it was about criminality. It wasn't about these structural ideological things that when people talked about jihadism, they were like, oh, it's because they want they want a caliphate or or they want uh, they've got the wrong sense of what religion is or they've seen they've seen some propaganda online, or, you know, those explanations. Um, we also found that you know in the UK, people did kind of absorb uh, quite a lot of kind of government narratives often. So we heard people talking about, so this is in uh, focus groups that we did to understand the far right. They would talk about and reproduce kind of rhetoric that the government had put out there to counter Islamist extremism. So they would talk about, well, you know, it's uh, Muslim communities have to take responsibility for extremism, they would say. Um, in France, we heard people talk about the normalization of the far right. You know, this is a period of time in which um, the Front National was rebranding. Um, they would talk about you know, the mainstreaming of racism and this being human nature was something that came up in French focus groups that didn't come up elsewhere. And still at this period of time, we did have a kind of Canadian distancing from the whole problem, um, as, as Emily mentioned. So there were differences and nuances in how the research on the far right differed between those groups and countries. But what we didn't do and what we would have liked to have done was get far more data and information about how radicalization to the far right happened. But, you know, all data is data. So when people, when a focus group doesn't engage with the question that you want them to answer, that's data. 
if you have to say, but what about the, the rally in, <laughs> that happened last week outside the library, that's data. And um, indeed we had some focus groups where in non-Muslim communities that were meant to be talking about the far right, that never talked about the far right. And you know, it was frustrating, but it was still data. Um, so we worked with what we had and, and it was all useful to us, no matter whether it was what we expected or not. Absolutely. And I'm going to refloat the idea of you guys doing a follow up study several years later, if we can get the band, uh, the band back together for it. Um, OK, so I'm going to switch over to the Q&A that's come through. We've already got a couple of questions. Um, don't know how you guys would like to respond, see who wants to respond and then, I don't know, bob their head, wave around, have a party. OK, so first one from someone that's anonymous. Could you share your insights on the actual agency of women within the so-called Islamic State? And what do you expect with their range of agency? So Catherine Wade first, off you go. <laughs> too slow, Emily. Um, <laughs> I'll try not to say too much. I think one of the key things is that um, the agency of women in Islamic State wasn't the priority within this particular set of research. That we were looking at the communities affected by women who, who ended up being affiliated or linked to Islamic State. Having said that, all three of us have engaged in research and policy work that connects to that issue um, and connects to the question around women's agency. And I think one of the really uh, positive things to, with regards to this field is a willingness to accept the idea and the reality that uh, women, as with men, are, are complex actors, which means that they are neither entirely free nor entirely constrained in their actions. And so we can move beyond assuming women are always and 100% victims and always and 100% not victims, right? Perpetrators. There, there's a mix in the middle. And I've been really reassured and kind of um, uh, pleased in a way that at least over the past few years, I mean, in my case, 15 years or so, talking about this topic, that that has shifted away from these stereotypes. Having said that, while there might be recognition at the policy or the strategic level of this shift, sometimes we find in communities um, and elsewhere a tendency towards stereotyping women's agency and not necessarily looking beyond this idea of women as victims, as duped, um, and not necessarily looking beyond their um, complex histories. Um, so if a woman is a victim of uh, domestic violence, the assumption is, oh, that must be the reason, rather than looking at what else might be going on, or assuming that that has nothing to do with it. And we really need that case by case analysis. Can I just, Absolutely. Emily, do you want to jump in? Yeah. yeah. It's just, just a quick point. It's just because it's an, in, it's an interesting question because it's something that I felt that when we presented this research back in you know, 2016, 17, so a number of years ago, we would have people say, um, yes, but you know, women's experience under, under ISIS um, is not particularly positive and you know, challenge us when we started talking about women having agency. Um, and I, we fully accepted that, but as Catherine said, the research was about people um, providing their understandings and perceptions of why women and men, um, but obviously you know, one of our focuses was women, um, you know, were attracted um, to traveling to Syria and Iraq. And people were able to, even if they didn't support um, ISIS, they were able to understand why the caliphate held um, a certain appeal for some women. And they were able to see that as women um, exercising their own agency. It wasn't necessarily a Western definition of agency, but it was their understanding of agency. Um, that does not mean that when they arrived in Syria and Iraq, um, their experiences and their hopes um, were, you know, absolutely thwarted and it wasn't exactly what they'd signed up for. But, you know, the point was, is that it was people understanding why people had been attracted rather than the actual lived reality um, of, of ISIS on the ground. And I think the timing is important too. You know, 2015-16, it, it wasn't, you know, we didn't have as much information about what was happening on the ground um, as, as we do now and obviously um, in later years. No, that's great. Um, next question is from Devora Marglin. Um, so first of all, great, great event and excellent book. Well done, guys. Um, so she's wondering if any of the authors had thoughts on the Biden administration's decision to move away from CVE 
and towards the creation of the Center for Prevention Programs and Partnerships, CP3 program. Um, so could you offer any advice on the formulation of CP3 and what is most important for the Department of Homeland Security to consider? Liz, was that you waving yeah, a finger well, we around? Yeah, we were talking about this <laughs> because we um, obviously there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of uh, fanfare on Twitter and uh, a lot of positivity around this uh, centre last week. And um, you know, looking at CP3, much of the language you know is the language of countering violent extremism. Countering violent extremism is about communities based programs it's about partnering with communities whatever else it's come to mean you know, that's essentially what it is so we've still got you know the language of supporting communities countering radicalization capacity building empowerment resilience education civil rights and liberties you know this for a u.s approach this is a divergence from but it's not vastly dissimilar from uh, the ways in which a lot of european projects work and the key thing for us is here's a moment in which to really think and talk about gender. And we didn't see that there. Um, and this to us is, you know, is a bit of a missed opportunity because people have been talking about gender for a long time and not just gender people. So to not really sort of have this uh, looming large within the narratives or, you know, it, it is a, a, an absence. And um, given all that we know about how radicalization happens, particularly with a focus on American domestic terrorism, um, anti-government militia, um, far right, um, we know the overlaps with many of these narratives, with misogyny, with violence against women, um, and it's, to, have, to not really reflect on this um, officially seems to be lacking. Absolutely. Okay, next question from Constance Wilhelm. Um, so really actually very interesting question regarding the media. So we'd be interested to hear what the interviewee's feedback was on how they were represented in the media, both as communities and as well as those within their communities that have been radicalized. Do they consider that they have a positive or negative interaction with the media? Emily. I'll take it and Liz is going to, ju going to jump in, I'm sure, afterwards. But as Liz um, did just say, you know, the media wasn't something that we'd actually um, had as a kind of key research question in the beginning. Um, but because of the way the research was done, which was basically to let um, participants themselves, you know, in tell us what they wanted to talk about and define um, the conversation, the media was something that they kept coming back to time and time again. Um, and basically, I think, you know, Muslim focus groups, young people in particular, you know, were saying we aren't portrayed well by the media. You know, when you think of violent extremism, the first you know image you see is a man with a beard um, or someone wearing a hijab. And you know, that was basically them and their interpretation um, of you know why they resisted the concept of violent extremism too. So it was very clear to them that there were these narratives and stereotypes around um, that were not only um, false in terms of um, you know their own perceptions of what was happening in terms of radicalization, that it's not just about you know men, men with beards going around um, <laughs> Joining, joining ISIS, for example, um, but it was also alienating. So it was them seeing violent extremism and the experience of radicalization um, as something which othered them, even if they had nothing to do with it. It was, you know, they had, didn't know anyone. Um, you know, it, was, it was a subject that they felt was, they were very removed from. Um, they felt that they were inevitably othered and discriminated and alienated um, as a result of it. And they definitely felt that the media um, perpetuated that that narrative. Did you want to add, Liz? Yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, we do make a recommendation about because it did, it was so prominent in the focus groups. And, you know, we did, we had focus groups of different, you know, uh, from from two people to 20 people from like, you know, an hour to two, two hours or longer. People really wanted to talk about these. They had a lot of, we heard not just, um, words we heard emotion a lot of anger and emotion that was reflected to us and many people ex expressed this as the process of talking to us even though they didn't think any good would come of it mainly but they did think that it was cathartic 
and they hoped that something might come of it. And talking about the media was part of this. So our recommendation is around the reporting of terrorism and, and um, training for journalists in, in better training for journalists, you know, not telling journalists what they can and can't report. Journalists must be free to report on you know, what is happening, but to um, educate around some of the impacts, some of the perceptions, and some of the ways in which this uh, you know, reads in communities. And, um, and that's an important thing because it came out of the research, although this wasn't at all something that we set out to kind of talk to people about, but it was extremely, um, it was something everyone wanted to get off their chests in the Muslim community focus groups. Yeah, and I'm sorry, just jump back in, because I think, you know, going back to that conversation we were saying, and Gina, you were saying it, about stereotypes and narratives, you know, we've all been talking for quite a long time about a little bit more of a sensitive approach um, to the language we use, and yet we still see time and time again, whether it's the jihadi bride or um, jihadi or whatever, you know, that you're talking about. I mean, it's still there every time you have media reporting. Um, it's not to attack the media. Media has its own job to do when it comes to the reporting on terrorism. And we need an, un, you know, we need a, a free and fair um, media, but um, there is a little bit more room for improvement, I think in terms of uh, sensitive uh, terminology, I would I would say. Yes, and actually it's, it's one of those things that you can give a nuanced analysis and you can give a nuanced quote to whichever journalist you're speaking to and they're sympathetic to exactly what you're getting at and want to get across this more nuanced um, point. But the headline of the article often says latest on jihadi brides or, you know, latest latest update on the jihadis or, or whatever it is. And you just think all of that work is being undone by the headline. And unfortunately, when this trickles down into local communities, those headlines are the things that resonate. So once again, findings for this from this book and from your, your broader research, all three of you, really do um, resonate beyond just scholarship, but also policy and especially the media is so important. OK, so hopefully quite a simple question. What were the reasons for looking specifically at Canada, France, Germany, Netherlands and the UK? There's um, yeah, that was so, so. We were um, we were in, we were fun, funded by Public Safety Canada, the Kanishka program. So that was one of the reasons was to include Canada for their benefit. But it was comparative. So we were looking at countries that had had um, different uh, relationships with CBE programming over different periods of times. From the UK, which has a very long established, you know, it's been the prototype of countering violent extremism programming and it's been replicated in English speaking countries and non-English speaking countries um, over the years. The Netherlands, which had a sort of city-based approach. Um, Germany, which again has a very sort of piecemeal approach. There's no kind of um, one national framework but it has had a much longer relationship with tackling the far right. Canada had, uh, because of the geographical distance, had lost far fewer people to Islamic State, also had you know, very active far right groups. And the security concerns of those governments were largely, you know, Al Qaeda, Islamic State inspired terrorism foremost, and then far right as a secondary um, issue. So we were interested in that they were similar enough to kind of enable us to uh, make some comparisons and they were different enough that we hoped we would get some kind of differing findings in these countries and and also of course it, you know the inclusion of Canada satisfied our, our funders and we know these contexts differently you have to say that our, our findings are not driven by our funding but the, the inclusion of Canada has clearly you know made sense on that basis um, so it, it was around comparison, it was around what we knew, where we could go, who we could talk to, and we had separate research teams in um, France and the Netherlands, and in fact in the Netherlands we didn't succeed in doing any research on the far right for various reasons, so we're a bit lopsided there. We had separate research teams also in Canada, and Emily and I did the UK research, and I did the German research. Um, so, um, and we had a sort of, you know, training to begin with where we were all kind of on the same, singing from the same hymn sheet. But essentially all of the research across these countries, we had one baseline question, how do you un understand violent extremism and radicalization? And then it was very free flowing. The approach was to allow those communities to tell their own stories. And so it was surprising to us when across those countries, they were telling very similar stories. Yeah, fascinating. 
Okay, this is actually a question directed to Catherine. Um, so could, could this gendered extremism view possibly lead to a synthetic construction of male and female stereotypes? And I would also add in here masculine and feminine stereotypes. Um, so what is a typical male and female view? Um, could this approach lead to a limitation of the interviewees to a certain gender in itself? So I think what's really important is recognizing how gender is a social construct. So of course, when we're doing focus groups, we recognize that who is talking to us may well also be presenting their own gendered understanding of a gendered phenomena. So it's so layered and integrated into what it is that we're analyzing. And that was also one of the reasons why we had both mixed focus groups, male only focus groups and women only focus groups to try and work through some of those layerings about those processes. So in that sense, I would suggest it, um, and I'm not sure uh, whether too much academic theorization is permissible in this space right now, but in that sense, there, there is this question over Butler's idea of gender as performative, and we recognize that how we present ourselves matters. So for the people in our focus groups, they were presenting also a particular understanding of themselves, but that would be true for all kinds of qualitative data. The second part that I think is important here is acknowledging how gender is also intersectional. So we're recognizing in many ways how class, race, relig religion and ethnicity, um, as well as gender um, as, and sexualities intersected with the uh, focus groups and what it was they were talking about. So we were mindful of the fact that within certain focus groups, they, was, they were coming from a particular uh, socioeconomic demographic within a particular area of a city, for example, who have effect had different experiences uh, say with police or local authorities, which influences again their own understanding of CVE and, and of violent extremism. And that's why one of our findings and one of our kind of key rooted uh, constant things is that to recognize that communities have knowledge as well. And we co-create knowledge in the focus groups as those discussions were going on, knowledge was being created and are and reflected upon. So the understanding of those in the focus groups and of ourselves developed over time. So it's, we weren't trying to pigeonhole people's understandings in either of gender or of violent extremism into a particular space, but that's co-creation of knowledge. And in a way, what we accidentally ended up doing was creating a, a, you know, almost not only a model for researching this space, because um, as, Elizabeth noted the difficulties of accessing different groups um, becomes really difficult. So what we end up doing is we talk to those around it who have experiences of the fallout. So we had this process, but it also ended up, as was said, this kind of cathartic kind of ability to talk about it and to expose that knowledge, which then can inform and deliver CVE. So actually by part of our recommendation is that CVE is done by listening to communities beyond the gatekeepers, beyond the, the community leaders, but actually working from the ground up to see what they need and to allow them to define themselves according to what it is that they need, not presupposing what's important to us is important to them. Um, and that, that structural consideration really kicks in there. And I think that's often a consideration that is sadly overlooked. Um, in many, uh, many research projects. So we've got 10 minutes left. I'm going to try and do three more questions um, and I'm going to try and condense and, um, and uh, put, group some of these into one, into one main question each. Okay, so first, what do you think is the cause and subsequent effect of respondents' lack of understanding of far-right extremism as structural or ideological, and how should this be addressed either by media, political actors, practitioners, policy, et cetera? So, uh, so I'll take this one. Um, yeah, thank, thanks for that. I mean, it's really hard to know exactly what the, the causes were of, of this distancing, you know, and it's something that's obviously been acknowledged and recognized by a number of different authors looking at the far right, the kind of moves that people make. But you know, one of the first things that happened in conversation about, um, so with the, the conversations with non, we called them inelegantly non-Muslim focus groups because they predominantly weren't, they weren't all white, but they were in areas where there'd been far right activism 
And one of the first things that they were in pretty much all focus groups keen to do was, you know, uh, uh, counter racism, assert their anti racism. So that we don't support these groups. We know about, um, you know, the EDL, Britain First. We know about um, Quebecois kind of uh, far right movements. We know about these, but but we don't support them. We're anti racist. And then they would open up the conversation, and then it would, you know, then they would have some very problematic conversations. But the assertion of anti racism was almost um, that it was as if that that was enough to kind of. Um, allow, enable, and justify anything that came subsequently. So it's a, it's a partly to do with, you know, there's a number of different things that come up. The media did come up, you know, it's very clear in that baseline question, what do you think extremism is, that um, the understanding of Islamic State as extremist at this point in time, and the far right as being criminal, hate, anger, stupidity, criminality, this was something to do with what they were used to seeing and how they were used to seeing things framed. But there was also a kind of, um, th this kind of, uh, again, a distancing move to say, these are stupid people, these are racist people, as if these are explanations in and of themselves, stupidity and racism, and that these were not kind of linked to the structural things that are going on in terms of institutional power, in terms of white privilege, in terms of um, issues that they didn't want to see and were reluctant to address. And, you know, we weren't educating people in the, you know, and it wasn't our task to do that. We weren't going into groups and saying that's wrong. This is, you know, we we're just listening to what people said and, you know, prompting further questions. And how people deal with this, you know, is really, really difficult because, you know, we fundamentally do advocate listening, active listening. And that has to happen in communities that feel angry and aggrieved and disempowered. And often, you know, Emily and I in UK focus groups heard a lot about, you know, very familiar narratives to people working on the far right. We're second class citizens. Everything is done for immigrants. Everything is in different language. You know, some of the very familiar tropes um, that far right groups push were replicated in the narratives of people who had begun the discussion saying we're anti-racism. Um, so how do you listen whilst um, educating and whilst taking a non-racist approach? How do you make people feel understood and not judged? Because one thing that is clear is that you cannot tell people what to think, not when their lived experiences are um, guiding what they say uh, about these issues. And, and so the way to do this is, you know, I wish I had, I wish the three of us had a very clear answer. The recommendations we make are around, you know, a combinations of education, um, you know, engagement with the media, engagement with policymakers, and simply, you know, making more visible. And I think that has happened in and of itself because the far right has seen such a rise in the last five or six years. Perhaps if we did go back into those communities, we would hear very different stories uh, in, in that regard. So sorry, I'll stop. No, that's all right. Um, so this question is a is a two parter. Please be brief. Um, so the first part is, is there an attraction by women to organisations such as IS or to right wing movements as a liberation? Um, and on the flip side, then, is there an effective counter to this, such as a renewed fo focus on equity of women in the state that is disconnected from simply or simplistic CT efforts? Emily. I'm gonna try and be quick, um, but it definitely came up um, when we were when we were interviewing um, participants that it was seen as a way of being able to live the life that they wanted to live. Um, so free from critique um, in their dress, you know, ability to um, wear the hijab without discrimination, without abuse, um, ability to practice Islam in the way that they wanted to. Um, and that's why the, you know, the caliphate was, was seen as a place um, where essentially they could be free. They could be, live um, the life that they, they, they had chosen to live. Um, and the counter, um, sorry, what was the second part of the question? The counter to it. Yes, the counter to it, whether there, there is a greater need for equity of women within the yeah. state or, or other CT efforts. So the, the fact is, is that this also kind of came up more in countries where there are um, dress codes, so there's bans on what you can wear in public spaces. So, for instance, um, in if you, you know, in France, 
if you can't apply for a job wearing the hijab, that was seen as a barrier to um, equal opportunities for, for work or what you're wearing in, in, in universities or education. Um, so, you know, dress as, you know, it might be a seem, kind of seemingly surface-based thing, but that was actually um, enhancing, well, and actually the reason for discrimination and for a lack of equity, um, in particularly in countries where that was um, prescribed. Catherine wants to jump in. Yeah, so I think we also have to be really cautious about using women's rights as yet another thing to stigmatize Muslim communities with mm -hmm. by recognizing that many of the women who travel to so-called Islamic State didn't fall into the stereotypes that some people would assume about their status or their education or the freedoms that they may or may not have. But also it doesn't explain or help us understanding in the same way why women might join far right groups. If we just simply say, oh, look, it's all about empowerment or um, those communities don't do it. You know, you've got to be really careful about not falling into those tropes. But we also need to be really careful about assuming and inviting the state in to secure women's rights, because that without due protection and without due regard to rights has not always gone well for women. So we want, again, to really think about what are the gendered harms of CVE. So how might the actual practices of countering violent extremism, it negatively affect women and women's rights, um, as well as how might they be used to enhance them and that that balance really needs to be carefully considered. I just want to very quickly say that, you know, we, we talked to families of young women who traveled, some were reverts, they, they, were, they were not, they became Muslim. So this question of, you, you know, that was really important and they would often be missed, their families would be missed from CV programming, really difficult. And also that when we talked to, you know, often, you know, there was no homogene, homogeneity in our groups. We had divisions between, there were women who were grandmas, women who were immigrants, women who were students, women who had kids who didn't have kids, who were married. And you know, some of the pious young women said, we get often as much discrimination and pushback from within our own communities. So there were many, many different stories being told um, here. And there was no one story um, is what I wanted to say. No, and that's important to reiterate because not all women are the same. Um, it's crazy how we have to keep explaining that. Um, Okay, so last one, and I think what I'll do is a quick fire. Each of you hopefully give me one point, and it's a great one to close on. Um, where do you see the key cap, key, key gaps, that could have gone badly wrong, um, for understandings of gender and radicalization within the CV and CT spaces? Start with Liz. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I'm doing more work on masculinities. You know, all of just gender is still a gap because it's been about women. You know, and, and we need as researchers and uh, in, engage in this field to, you know, make sure that that is not just the case. And let's not replicate the mistakes around women when we're thinking about masculinities. That's a big gap for me. Emily? Um, mine would be around data um, that, sorry, Catherine, if that was yours, but always, you know, that the, there is still a lack of data in this space, particularly, I think, um, in terms of CVE programming and how you can better work with men and women and the different roles that people have. And then the impacts um, on of violent extremism and, and CVE on men and women. Mine would say would be about the intersectionality. Um, and really taking that as an approach. Something we tried to do in the book, I think we could probably, if we were to do this work again, do that in a more systematic way. Um, but I would say that the, this field really needs to engage more carefully with intersectional approaches and what that might mean um, for them. And then the second point would be, our book focuses really on two main ideologies as an extremist, jihadist, largely Sunni-ish, but not, so you can hear all of these kind of caveats coming around. And I mean that seriously, right? So it's unpacking the diversity within these uh, extremist groups and broad speaking ideologies. Same with the far right, we had challenges. Are they far right extremists? Um, there's, I forget all the different terms we went through about defining the far right, but also then uh, thinking about other forms of extremism as well and how the diversity within these uh, categories um, and the diversity across categories can be understood through a gendered lens.
No, that's great. And I'm really pleased that you brought up intersectionality because that was the approach of my thesis. So thanks, Catherine. Um, OK, so all that remains for me to say is huge thank you and encourage anyone to um, read the book, go and get the book, encourage, there you go, there's the cover being waved around. Um, also encourage your uh, university or institutional library to get a copy of the book. It's really an important and valuable contribution to this field. Um, hard evidence to break down some of the challenges and stereotypes that we've all been banging on about for quite a while, but I'm so pleased that you guys have gathered the data and really done a rich analysis on this. It's so important. So thank you very much. Thanks everyone for, for joining and um, for your questions. And I think it's actually a testament to, to how interesting it is that we didn't have um, a dropout throughout this event. We've had really high numbers of, of participants throughout. So thank you all very much.